Presented by Caltech. Good afternoon. To meet Shirley Malcolm is to be inspired by her. Although that inspiration is directed along many directions, science, national policy, human capital, our country's capital, Africa, civil rights, how to live one's life, it seems especially appropriate to me that STEM education is today's topic. Teach Week is only a snapshot in time, but as such, it is an opportunity to bring the same rigor that we apply to the research part of Caltech's mission to the teaching and education part of Caltech's mission. And what better way than to learn from an expert who is generous with her insights and her wit. Shirley Malcolm is Director of Education and Human Resources Programs at the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a valued member of the Caltech Board of Trustees. At AAAS, Shirley leads efforts to improve the quality of STEM education and career programs, increase access for underrepresented groups, and enhance public understanding of science and technology. Dr. Malcolm's lifelong effort to improve science education access to underrepresented minorities began with two failed freshman chemistry quizzes at the <laughs> University of Washington in Seattle. She had never seen chemistry equipment until walking into her college lab and was afraid that her professor would think her incapable and suggest a lower track. Instead, she approached the course's teaching assistant, the only African-American graduate student in the entire department. Quote, I told him that I wasn't dumb. I was just having a really difficult time. I told him I needed some guidance, but that I could do the work. I knew I had the ability. He believed her. Under his tutelage, she aced the next quiz and gained a foothold to continue in science. Dr. Malcolm has been the one to provide help ever since. If someone says diversity isn't important, she says, don't believe it. Following her bachelor's degree at the University of Washington, Dr. Malcolm earned a master's degree from UCLA and a PhD in ecology from Penn State. In 1976, she co-authored a landmark report, The Double Bind, The Price of Being a Minority Woman in Science. From 77 to 79, Dr. Malcolm served as program officer in the Science Education Directorate at the National Science Foundation. During the following decade, she served as the head of the AAAS Office of Opportunities in Science and became director of Education and Human Resources in 1989. In her career-long effort to reach and engage minority populations in science, Dr. Malcolm has developed and led a variety of innovative projects, including programs designed to connect African-American and Latino communities with science, an online science adventure series, which I'd like to sign up for, and a digital library for undergraduate biology education. And there's more, if I can turn the page. Dr. Malcolm served on the National Science Board from 1994 to 1998 on PCAST from 1994 to 2001. On the international front, Dr. Malcolm was an organizer for the meeting of the Panel of Experts on Science, Technology, and Women to prepare for the UN Conference on Women held in Nairobi, Kenya in 1989. Since then, she has served as a US delegate to conferences on science across the world including a powerful speech last year in Kuwait on women scientists in leadership roles, providing inspiration for the next generation of women leaders. Dr. Malcolm holds more than a dozen honorary degrees and is a fellow of the AAAS and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2003, she received the Public Welfare Medal of the National Academy of Sciences, the highest award given by the Academy to honor extraordinary use of science for the public good. As you no doubt can tell, I am honored to call Dr. Malcolm a friend and thrilled to welcome her today 
to give the keynote address for Teach Week at Caltech. Shirley. Thank you very much, Tom. That was kind and too long. <laughs> it's OK. Um, I'm honored to be here. I spend a lot of time on the Caltech campus, actually. I've been a member of the board since 1999 and have seen a lot of changes uh, over the time. And, uh, and so I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, some of you may be wondering about the title of this presentation. Uh, I want to explain that I received my PhD from Penn State in 1974. That was a long time ago. I'm old, okay? It's fine. The point is, though, that when I received my PhD, I was trained to be a researcher. I never was prepared to teach. I think the assumption was that somehow I would go into a classroom and that I'd figure it out. And I think that that's not necessarily a good assumption. Now, I want to talk about the other part of my title here. There are a lot of things that, where places where research tells us the best way to do something, but we don't necessarily do what's best, okay? We know better about a lot of things. I will give you one example. We have known better uh, about the fact that kids who live in poverty have experienced something called summer loss. That is, because they do not have enriching experiences between June and September, that there is a lot of loss and a lot of lag so that when they come back in September, you spend a lot of time trying to reteach them what they had from April to June. Okay. Now, we've known that since 84. Do you see people scrambling to put programs in place to prevent summer loss? Not necessarily. Not in most places. What you see is really a kind of a loss of the achievement levels. So there's a difference between knowing better and doing better. Knowing better is often a function of the research. Doing better is often a function of policy. And there is a gap in between those things. And so I want to tell you a little bit about kind of how to close that gap as we also talk about this story. Uh, I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and I'm old enough that that's me on the right, okay? I'm old enough that, in fact, uh, I went to segregated schools. Uh, I finished high school uh, at a time when, um, well, it was a tumultuous time. Let's just say it like this. But one of the things about being in Birmingham was that you had all kinds of very interesting experiences. Uh, including a sense of kind of disempowerment and disenfranchisement. And it was deliberate. And so that was a part of the memory that you had. So one of the things is that I came from a long line of educators. This is my great aunt. She's a great aunt by marriage, but she was just absolutely wonderful and was a major influence on the, on the lives of my sister and me, she would basically take us to concerts or what have you to try to, you know, enrich our own experiences. This is Aunt Bessie. Uh, Aunt Bessie was a, an educator in the Birmingham Public Schools for almost 50 years, a teacher and then a principal. And Aunt Bessie uh, then, uh, when she retired, started to take up a new role. She uh, ran and was elected as the first African-American woman on the city council of Birmingham, Alabama. This is the same Birmingham that you heard about with Bull Connor, et cetera. And I was like, OK, this is an interesting result here. Aunt Bessie basically moved out of the schools and then went into the public policy arena. Now, this is, these are my parents, OK, my mother, Lily, and my father, Ben, they're now deceased, 
but my mother was a third grade school teacher. So with all of these teachers, educators in my life, the expectation was kind of, well, I would follow along and that I too would become an educator. Now, this is at the time that I finished my doctorate. It was a, I had a kind of a tough time with, with uh, Aunt Bessie's husband, my great uncle, Jerry. Because Uncle Jerry said, will she never finish school? <laughs> he didn't get that PhD thing. I mean, he just knew that you just kept going until you finished, right? And that it wasn't clear when you would finish, right? All right, Uncle Jerry didn't get that part. He says, why doesn't she just come home and become a teacher like her mother and her aunt and her cousin and Okay, that was not me, all right. This is Lewis School. This is where I went to school. This is the fixed up version of Lewis School. And at Lewis School, uh, I was one of those kinds of magical places where I discovered a group of wonderful educators. But you know, the context of our lives matter a lot, all right. For me, the big context was on the one hand, the civil rights, and on the other hand, Sputnik. Sputnik in October of 1957, the bombing, this is my mother and grandmother's church, Bethel Baptist Church, uh, that was bombed on Christmas night of 1956. Um, you ever experience a bomb blast? You know, being awakened by a bomb blast? You never really get over it. And I think that this idea that somehow, you gotta make sense of it. You're 10 years old, you're trying to make sense out of it. And so you're trying to make sense out of a lot of things. But in this particular case, I think that it has forever affected my own uh, view of the world. Now, this was after the bomb blast. This was the day after uh, Christmas. And that's Reverend Shuttlesworth, who was the pastor at the time. And the other person is my grandmother. And that other little face you see down there in the corner. That's me. I didn't know that this picture actually existed. I found out because part of it was in Spike Lee's movie for little girls. And I had never seen the full picture. I saw my grandmother and Reverend Shuttle's work. I saw that hug, but I did not see the other part. And it was only when Reverend Shuttle's work died and there was a part of, what is it, Hail and Farewell that's on CBS that I saw the full footage. That was the first time when I was 60 some years old that I in fact saw that I had been, at that, that moment in history where context was being set mattered a lot. So I wanted to tell you about two of my teachers at, at Lewis School, Mr. Smoot, who was my science teacher, and Miss Goddard, who was my seventh grade teacher. Mr. Smoot, everybody was talking about Sputnik, et cetera, and he decided that he would use the space race as motivation, and he had us all excited about it. We were not just building rockets, what have you, out of paper towel tools or tubes or whatever, but he was also helping us to think about what kind of learning did we need to know before in order to go into space. What kinds of problems had to be solved? And I think, you know, I stop and think about that. It's really kind of amazing to get somebody who had never thought about that to really start thinking about that. Um, so he encouraged our interest in science. And Miss Goddard was the person who uh, I think emphasized excellence. I was kind of a sloppy writer in the sense that I misspelled a lot of words. Now I'm the best editor in my unit uh, because she, she valued that, and she taught me that that's important. Um, she had 40 kids in her class, and there was no way that she could provide instruction to 40 kids. So she took a bunch of us and stuck us in the back of the class and said, I cannot help you. I need to help them. You need to help each other and then help yourself. And what she taught us was essentially peer learning and independent, to learn independently. She taught us how to become independent learners. 
And quite frankly, had I not done that, I probably would not be here today because in so many cases, I kept finding my deficiencies and having to plug holes about things that I did not know. So I went on to Carver High School. And Carver High School um, was, uh, it was an interesting place. We did not have a junior and senior class. We just had freshmen and sophomores. And the wonderful thing, and when we started, so we became the seniors by working our way through the system. Now, the, you know the best thing about that? Our, the guys on our football team were too small to take, be taken seriously as a football team. So athletics was not an issue. Everybody paid attention to academics. Now, I mean, you see these high schools, and it's about the football and, and it's about the basketball game. But if you don't have football or basketball, you just go for what you know. All right, so, but in 63, when I finished Carver, there was no prom. As a matter of fact, uh, the schools were shut down. Uh, we were all living under martial law, and it was the time of the Children's March. A good number of my classmates were in jail, and um, they were being threatened with expulsion. And uh, Dr. King went to federal court in Atlanta to stay the decision of the Board of Education so that the kids could graduate high school and go on to college. So it was a very interesting time. Some of you may have heard of a friend of mine from Birmingham, Freeman Murbowski. Freeman did get arrested, okay? He was 12, he got arrested. Uh, I did not get arrested because I did not go down there because they stopped running the buses. They wouldn't even let you get near the place. So I left and went to the University of Washington. And, and as you heard a little bit from what Tom, what President Rosenbaum said, I experienced a massive culture shock. And the culture shock was in part because I was underprepared from what I had experienced. But the other part of the culture shock is that I had gone from a totally black community into the University of Washington. University of Washington, even today, doesn't have a whole bunch of people of color. But at that time, it was really, really um, unbelievable. So to avoid a quick exit, I had to make a social cultural adjustment. In so many cases, you were the only, the only African American in the dorm, the only one in your class, the only one in wherever. Where are all the young women in my science classes? I mean, it was. Where are black students anywhere? I had a counselor, because I went in as a pre-med major, and I had a counselor who basically told me that my grades, even though they were above a B average, were not good enough to get into medical school because only a few women were taken each year into medical school and that I did not make the cut. Okay, you can either go with that or you can ignore that. And you just, I just chose to ignore her. But I also had to ignore my English teacher's surprise that I could write. And I had to ignore student comments, including the one from the student in my comparative anatomy lab who said, well, why are you here anyway? Don't you realize you're taking a man's place in medical school? But you know, that was 1960 something. I mean, after all, People were kind of surprised to see people like me in places like that. And I, you've heard the almost failing chemistry lab. There is nothing wrong with seeking help. And that's one of the things that I learned because it doesn't mean you're dumb. It basically means you're smart to seek help. So these two guys basically helped me find a place in that department. Uh, Alan Cohn, who became my advisor when I decided that I did not like the pre-med majors and would abandon that course. And Bob Payne, for whom I TA'd. And Bob Payne is really one of the fantastic, the greatest ecologists that has been, ever been around. And so this is, these guys helped me basically affirm for myself that I was worth investing in and that I could do the work. So graduate school was catching up on the course, coursework, learning to think like a scientist, trying to do, figure out how to be a researcher. 
and serving as a teacher assistant, but never really learning how to teach. So when in graduate school, you also encountered these faculty members who gave the most incredible seminars that you've ever gone, been in in your life and the worst lectures that you have ever <laughs> experienced in your life. And I had these people too. And it was a matter of teaching as we were taught, not as we were taught to teach because we weren't taught to teach and becoming dissatisfied with teaching as we were taught. And that's really what had to happen in order to change what you do. And you know, from time to time saying, where's the help desk? Well, who's around that can basically help to guide me? And what I ended up doing is basically thinking about and going back to my roots. What does that mean? In my mother's third grade class, every child learned to read. Now you think about how amazing this is. She had 35, 36 children in her class and they were coming. These were not tracked. This was whoever showed up, that's who she had. And yet, she, every single one learned to read. And I found out that this was basically because she, she treated every child as an individual and knew what was going on in their lives. And as she encountered different kinds of problems, some not even knowing the sounds that the letters made, whatever problem she encountered, that's what she dealt with. It was do whatever it takes. And I think that is a strong message. Mr. Smoot's drawing on contemporary events. Ms. Goddard's focus on collaboration and helping us learn how to learn. And I did take a methods of teaching in the biological sciences class at UCLA as part of my plan B. Everybody who's in a PhD program needs a plan B. That was mine, okay. But <laughs> I learned a thought about learner-centered teaching. Uh, largely that learners do not come to us as blank slates, no matter what we think, that even though they may have had the courses, that does not mean that they understand the concepts. That's another absolutely critical issue, that they often need explicit skill instruction. I clearly needed that in my chemistry class. I hadn't seen that stuff. And that there are advantages to collaborative learning in diverse environments. And the last thing is the more real, the better. When you are dealing with things that are authentic, it has strong motivational aspects as well as basically it, it matters and you learn that it matters. And I think that is really um, a part that is, that is really critical. Now, the connection between teaching and learning and diversity and inclusion what really connected me, that connection was made with uh, Elaine Seymour and Nancy Hewitt's book, Report. And I think that it, that happened for a lot of people, uh, talking about leaving, why undergraduates leave the sciences. <clears throat> and uh, what Elaine and Nancy did was really thorough ethnographic kind of work where they were in classrooms and they were talking to people and they wanted to find out why people left. And it was important that they found out why people left because there were some people leaving more than other people. And one of the things that, that they pointed out was the role of introductory courses. That in fact, as gatekeeper courses, that they were kind of weed out courses and that this was a way of really losing a whole bunch of people before they had even had an opportunity to see whether or not this worked for them. And that it had, <clears throat> uh, it was a matter of how the courses were being experienced by the learners and that it had a disproportionate impact on women and minorities. So at some point, this whole question about teaching and learning uh, the, and the, this, the quality of teaching in STEM was elevated to the highest policy levels. The Obama administration, PCAST, um, undertook the work and produced the report uh, engaged to excel, producing one million additional college graduates with degrees in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, th as they looked into the future, what they saw was increased demand for people, especially in areas such as engineering and computer science, but they didn't see the people showing up who were gonna basically meet that demand. Now, there are economists will tell, who will tell you there is no such thing as a 
uh, and under supply and that it's all good, it's all great and what have you. But the larger question that was being asked in the context of PCAS was how do we address this issue of the quality of teaching, which is at its base a local problem. You cannot, in fact, just look at this as you made, raise, you wave a magic wand in DC and something wonderful happens. That hasn't occurred for a long time. And one of the wonderful things was that it's like there was momentum that was being gathered from a lot of different places, including the AAU, uh, Undergraduate STEM Initiative, and it began to try to fix some of these issues and try to really double down on uh, the causes uh, for the uh, intro class um, uh, issues. And, peak, and this report pointed out this, the idea that I started with, and that is that the traditional teaching methods have trained many of the professionals that are now in there. So where are we going to get this idea about how to do this differently? <clears throat> I think we're fortunate here at Caltech that we do have a Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach. Uh, I know it's only five years old, uh, but in fact, the idea that there is a help desk uh, and a place to go is really, really important because the, we know that a diversification of teaching methods is absolutely critical. This is uh, a report that kind of drew me into the middle of this. This is an academy report on barriers and opportunities uh, for two year and, and four year STEM degrees. I chaired this consensus panel and um, the, the issues here were absolutely critical because there were some questions that needed to be answered. Number one, do we lose more people from STEM than, than non-STEM people lose? Yeah, okay. So why is it that we are losing people? We have not talked much about two-year colleges, and yet if we don't talk about two-year colleges, we can't have a really honest discussion about diversity because that's where diverse populations are going and in entering the higher education system. So one of the really difficult parts about doing this work for barriers and opportunities was that there were so many different issues that we had to touch upon, not just the policies that were operating within the university, not just the policies that were operating within the state or, or what have you, but also issues of financing, the issues that there were different people who were going in than we thought. The data weren't be co being collected in ways that could give us any insights into why we were losing people. But the bottom line was that the environments, and this is a quote from the report, may not be welcoming. The teaching may be uninspired. So, these were the fundamental pieces that we had to do. I actually had somebody draw this for me a while back. Um, this is Humpty Dumpty uh, as a physics major. Um, I know the physicists keep saying, why you keep picking on physicists? <clears throat> because they're so deserving. Uh, okay. So this is the Humpty Dumpty leaving physics. And I asked the question, and is it attrition? or is it a failure to retain, okay? Because in one case, it's Humpty Dumpty making that decision. In another case, it is where our institutional infrastructure fail students who otherwise could be successful. Now, I love this. I, I'm a big fan of mysteries, mystery stories. And uh, I love this quote from P.D. James. When I first heard that Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, I immediately wondered, did he fall or was he pushed? And so I said I was not the only one who suspected foul play. So it was this kind of, of issue of understanding where we, how we got to this point. So the PCAS report really started to give us places to look. They said that in high, for high achieving students, high performing students frequently, they will cite uninspiring introductory courses as a factor that leads to their switch in majors. 
but for many of the students who are not usually in these classes, members of minority groups, women, students who are first generation, students who are otherwise marginalized, they cite an unwelcoming environment, an unwelcoming atmosphere from faculty and STEM courses as a reason for their departure. So we have to look at those, in both of those issues, the teaching issue, the class environment issue, and that's what we will want to do. This is, these are a series of articles that I've, I've spoken with Cassandra about. Let's try to pull a collection together here so that you can look at them in more depth and really understand what these articles are telling us. At the bottom line, they are saying that active uh, learning is so much better than just about anything else that you can do. And, and that we have known this for a long time. And I just gave you three articles. There's a whole bunch of other articles that are back there that keep saying the same thing over and over again. So that's the knowing better. The doing better article, doing better question mark article, just came out three weeks ago in Science, where it, it talked about uh, looking at STEM teaching. So they observed over uh, 2,000 classes taught by 500 uh, STEM faculty across 25 institutions uh, using a, a protocol so that they could standardize the way that they collected the observational data. Uh, and they came up with three uh, broad instructional profiles from all of that observation. Didactic, interactive, and student-centered. Didactic being where over 80% of the time, of classroom time, was actually spent in lecturing. Okay, little bit, maybe occasionally a question and answer. Interactive was largely um, was didactic with, didactic plus, uh, where there might be an opportunity. Um, for example, you use clickers and then you had a little bit of group work. And what they found was that didactic practices were prevalent throughout undergraduate courses, despite everybody knowing that they had limited impact, right? So the major point is that faculty often will say, well, there are too many students. 600 students, you just can't do active learning with 600 students. I, I have friends who do do six, active learning with 600 students. Uh, or the classroom layout, they can't do, they, they need to be able to be flexible. But Essentially, this work says that independent of class size and independent of the flexibility of the room, that you still get didactic practices. So we aren't doing better, okay? So we have this other part, the culture of STEM. When we did this report uh, on barriers and opportunities, we had, um, we had a chapter in that it was controversial uh, on the culture of STEM. It was so controversial, I went through report review twice because people are nervous about the idea that maybe the values and norms of STEM themselves manifest in such a way as to be off-putting for particular student groups. So that they, have, that they impact students' interest, the culture of STEM, uh, self-concept, sense of connectedness and persistence, and everybody's saying all oh, this soft stuff. You know what? That soft stuff is the difference between staying and leaving. It's like, who do I identify as? Do I identify as a scientist? Do I, can I connect who I am as a person to study in these fields? Am I a learner who is accepted in this? And then there's the issue that the faculty set the tone. They're the ones who call on or don't call on particular students, or cut students off or don't, or allow students' peers to talk or make comments without shutting that down and really conveying the idea of respect. That there is a heavy focus on natural ability. Um, if you think that, it's, that innate talent rules the day, this is a strong predictor of the representation. Those fields, the strong prediction, 
pre uh, predictor of the representation of women and blacks in those fields. And then you have the implicit bias that goes on in the classroom, in classroom interactions. Small numbers and assumptions about fit. When you're the only one or the only one or two or the only one or two or three, how you interact with each other, with the faculty member, with your peers, that's a problem. It can be a problem, okay? Now, one of the things that we are looking at with regard to the culture of STEM, and this article, again, will be available. Um, we want to look at the, something called field-specific ability beliefs. Now, in this particular case, we look both at the natural sciences and at the social sciences and humanities, because we aren't the only ones who are guilty of this. It's not just math and physics and computer science and engineering. It's also philosophy and economics. So you see the same kinds of patterns that are appear with regard to the predictive power of this field-specific ability beliefs. You ask someone, you, you, how smart do you have to be to be in this field? And you end up with this notion that if you be really, really smart, that's the field that you, for you. Okay, same pattern appears for African Americans, field specific ability beliefs. The top is for African Americans, the bottom is for Asian Americans where the stereotypes do not hold, and what you see is you do not see the same predictive aspects for the bottom as for the top. So the thing that really, I think, that just really makes me crazy is how early these gender stereotypes are set up. And this is another article from Science that essentially says by six years old, by six years old, that you have girls who will say that they are not in the very, very smart group. All right, at five, they will say they're very, very smart. At seven, you, nope. Okay, so like, what happens at six? Well, I mean, one of the things that happens is they go to school. And they interact with peers and with teachers and what have you. But when you, in fact, adopt this idea and you situate yourself that you, there are things you won't do if they are associated with very, very smart people. You won't even try them. So we have problems that not only manifest themselves within the classroom, we have problems in the larger culture. And so it becomes really, really hard to kind of break through these things. The culture of STEM also talks about ways of knowing and discourse. So for some populations, such as Native American populations, you could have difficulties with some of these issues of, of discourse. Argumentation, people always talk about argumentation in science. Well, you're not supposed to argue with your elders in certain cultures. You talk about the, the question of, uh, I have had this one friend who was from the Iroquois Confederacy group of of, uh, in, of um, Native Americans, and he said, I had a real hard time when I came to school because all my faculty members were male, and my, I come from a matrilineal community, and so I don't believe things unless a woman tells me. My grandmother, my aunt, my whatever. But so we, we make assumptions and we set things in place based on a, one set of assumptions about who's, our, who's in school and what have you. We have the problem of lower expectations of faculty and peers that, in fact, they don't expect you to do well. Uh, difficulty in finding community and cultivating a sense of belonging. If you're the only one, you're going to have a problem. And oftentimes, the way that we form groups in our classes you know, in elementary school, you count off one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four to form groups. In college, you let people seek their own level, and guess what? They seek their own level, and they seek people who are like them, as opposed to taking advantage of the diversity that might be available. Uh, stereotypes and stereotype threats, 
And deficit thinking, what focusing on what students do not bring as opposed to what they do. Okay. Now, so I told Cassandra this morning, I said there's lots of things, recommendations that you can make for this. Number one is that from this point on, you can say no graduate student or postdoc who is here should ever come leave here without having the opportunity to really focus on teaching. You have to stop the, the bad practice. So, you know, just cut it off from henceforth and forever. We won't do that. But then the other question is, how do we enable faculty who are already here who want to really learn different kinds of things and structures and strategies and what have you, how do we in fact assist them uh, in that? And I think that's another aspect. But I decided that I couldn't just talk to you this whole time. That doesn't make sense. It's not good modeling. And so what I wanted to do was to give you a case study. And what I want you to do is I want you to talk to the people who are around you about what you see in what I put up. And I'm going to give you about three minutes to just kind of focus on it. It's not enough time, but three minutes is better than nothing, okay? So in Caltech, they like graphs and numbers <laughs> and what have you. So what do you see here? Okay, talk to each other. Cassandra's going to come around, and uh, as you, if somebody wants to share, raise your hand, and Cassandra will come around. And I have great wait time. We will just be here, okay? Are we just contributing what we think might be happening? Okay. Uh, I like to volunteer because I teach too, so I know you don't want to stand up there and wait. Uh, so one thing that we were talking about is that this looks like the mid 80s things went down for women in computer science and that's the advent of the personal computer. So people had computers in their homes. I, I had one in my home starting then. So I don't know what kind of correlation there might be between people having access to personal computers and women, some, something in the culture changing. I don't know. So that, that was something we were talking about. Okay, that's actually very good because that is being, how many of you thought the same thing? All right, with the advent of, the per, of personal computing, uh, there, there, was, um, there were data that were collected that indicated that, par that folks would buy, tend to buy these things for their sons, okay? And so you ended up uh, at, in 84, 85, you're starting to get this downward trajectory because you're starting to identify computing as male. Okay, all right, what else do you see here? Wait, wait, it's coming to you. We had a slightly different tilt. We said that's when computing and gaming started, so maybe it wasn't as attractive to the females that it was about gaming. Okay. What else do you see here? So we also noticed there's a drop at around 2003 or 2005. I'm sorry, speak a little bit. So we also noticed there's a drop in computer science women uh, percentage at 2005, around 2005-ish. We're not sure what happened, maybe, so it was my college time, maybe it's something related to personal laptop. Yeah. Okay. Coding. What else do you see there? So we talked a little bit about how in the mid 80s was when computer science started to be out in the public eye and then all the role models that you saw were male, typically. And when, you know, being in college a little bit after that, when you actually saw these computer science departments, you know, they were flooded kind of with new folks, but there wasn't a lot of like tutelage or, you know, folks that had been in it for a while. Uh, they were more cliquish. You know, you kind of go into the computer science department, it was 
it was kind of a strange place to be, kind of foreboding, dark, you know, all these things, and not very welcoming. Okay. And so I think that was all part they of a kind culture of set up that was being caves. established. <laughs> yeah, they did. That, I, I wasn't going to say it that way, but that is what they did. Okay. All right. All right. Do we have another? Just keep handing that back. This is not a, a speculation so much as a question. Um, there's, there's obviously a small transitory dip in the representation in the physical sciences that seems to recover, uh, but, but it seems to occur at the same time that these substantial turnarounds in computer science do. So yeah. around 1985, you see a little transitory blip in physical sciences, which corresponds with a permanent downward trend in computer sciences, and then again in 2000. And Four, it looks like. There's another little dip, which Okay, one of the things that we have to remember is that when they aggregate physical sciences like that, what they end up doing is putting chemistry and physics and mathematics together. And so we, what, we would have to disaggregate that in order to try to figure out whether that was a math dip followed by a chemistry gain, because the gains in chemistry have been substantial. All right, so we, it's, as they say, it's complicated. But it, thank you for your observation, OK? Anybody else? Right, yeah, OK, Rick. If I look at the beginning, of the plot. Notice that in the 60s into the early 70s, physical sciences are at the top, though low. Then you start seeing a rise, but you see a much more dramatic rise in computer science, but also in medical school and law school. And I don't have any speculation. I think the medical school and law school were opening up doors that had not been opened before. Okay. Does anybody want to tell me why that was? What happened in 72, 73? Title IX was passed in 72. And all of a sudden, it totally changed the slope of these lines because what ended up happening was that the, the women who basically took themselves out of law and medicine because they weren't being selected, they turned around and said, oh, okay, the law says that we can now do this. And so they went in, and these numbers basically have continued to rise. Now, the thing that, that we also need to look at is how computer science has continued to fall and how it, there, there's a lot of feedback from the workforce and from the computing community that is really continuing to push those things down. Now, I'll tell you why I showed you this. Because this is, essentially, this is what I do every day, trying to make sense out of trends that relate to things that are national, that policies that are local, things that are happening in classrooms, things that are happening uh, with regard to local policies or what have you. Because these are systems problems, and they are not going to be solved by any one thing. And so trying to figure out how to nudge systems is kind of like where I'm spending my time right now. Uh, we just undertook a major initiative called Sea Change, which is lead-like lead certification for diversity and inclusion for colleges and universities. And we, not just for the institutions, but also for the departments. We're working with the professional societies. For example, we're working with all the physics groups to come together and articulate what the criteria, in fact, might be. You think about what LEED certification did for building. All right, so what we're trying to do is model this on the work that was done in the UK by for Athena Swan. We're trying to take all the good work that happened by ADVANCE, by AGAP, and really build on that to put, give the opportunity for universities to declare 
that they are places that welcome diversity and inclusion, that they are trying to solve the problems that they have that relate to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and that they are using research-based practices in order to do that. So do I have a crazy job? Yes. At one point, when asked, when one of my daughters, who shall remain nameless, was asked, what, <laughs> what did her mother do? The answer was, my mother goes to meetings. <laughs> and while I go to a lot of meetings, it's also a matter of trying to understand the way that systems can be barriers to people, but also that they can open opportun opportunities for access. So I have one last slide just for Cindy. Um, and this is, I have, I have uh, uh, kind of set up a, an expectation that I will include at least some poetry in every presentation. And in this particular case, I want to point to the clerk. This is the pro prologue. Now the clerk, nobody pays attention. He's a scholar, he's a student, okay, of natural philosophy. At this time, natural philosophy was I mean, essentially what the moral equivalent of physics is now, but the, but the point is that he uh, was pretty scruffy. He basically borrowed money from his friends and spent it all on books. Uh, he, that was what he did. That was what, what, uh, who he was. And I just like this last part. Not one word spoke he more than was his need. And that was said in fullest reverence and short and quick and full of high good sense. Pregnant of moral virtue was his speech and gladly would he learn and gladly teach. And I think that's really where we all want. We want to share the joy that we have for learning, especially in the science fields, because they are fields that I have found have been personally empowering. And that's important for someone who came from roots that were characterized by powerlessness. Gladly would he learn and gladly teach. Gladly do we learn and gladly teach. Thank you. We have two minutes for questions. <laughs> We've been doing a lot of questioning along the way. So Dr. Malcolm, thank you very much. I wanted to ask you a question about one of the things I've seen like in my community, in the Hispanic community. It's not just that the, we don't have students who are willing to learn, but like when they go back to their families, especially when they're talking about like having a career in science or, or you know, an engineering field, the families don't believe the promise of what's being offered. They don't understand and it. often they reject it. Have you seen anything that actually addresses that? Uh, I think that the only thing that they can do that can address that is existence proofs. Those of us who have, who have made our way in through those pathways, basically, that we have to be more visible and we have to talk about what it means and what you gain, not just what you lose. And I, you know, in one particular case, I told a student, have your mother call me, <laughs> you know, because that it, otherwise it's like you're, you are becoming something that they, they don't have any idea and they don't understand the role of, of the scientist. So it makes it a really tough schlag. And I think that, it, that they have, you know, you've, they've got to be shown that this is possible, that it is doable, and that it, you can have a good life from it. Shirley, one more time. It's a great honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so very much.